Hello everyone, welcome to video 30 of chapter 3. In this video, we will complete the proof for theorem C, the convergence proof for the simplex algorithm. And uh, this is the second part of that proof. So the first part, we set up the theorem and we say we're using induction and uh, we proved the base case where m equal 1. And now we continue the proof and now we talk about the induction step. So here's the induction step. Assuming the statement holds for the LP problem with m minus 1 or fewer equations. Okay, that's the assumption of the inductive step. Now, under that assumption, we need to prove that the statement holds for the LP problem with one more equation, namely m equations. Okay, so there are two um, big cases here we call case capital A and case later case capital B. Let's look at case capital A. Case capital A, we assume that for the m equations that we have there, at least one of the bi is not zero. Okay, that is the, the case we'll be looking at first. Okay, so there are several steps we need to talk about. Okay, so step one, if that is the case, we would apply simplex algorithm until we cannot pivot further to reduce the z value. That is, two possibilities, either the problem is solved, and then great, then we stop, or because of degeneracy, um, the problem is not solved and I cannot move further to reduce z because it's degeneracy, meaning some of the bi's on the right hand side, they are zero. And we need to discuss further what to do then. Okay, step two. Now we are in the degeneracy case. Okay, so introduce an integer r, r equal to the number of the bi's that are zero. Okay. And then by lemma a, since we know that some of the b's are zero, but we start with the part that not all bi's are zero. Okay, then by lemma a, we know that not all the bi's are zero, so this r here will be strictly less than m, m is the number of constraints. Okay, so um, now we can rearrange our equations and the variables such that we put all the equations with the zero, with bi equals zero first, line them up, and we rearrange the x such that um, the um, x1 to xr will be um, the basic variables. Okay? So, um, so all the bi's will be zero if i is from 1 to r, that's how many there are. And then for bi with i bigger than r, and these bi's are strictly bigger than zero. Okay, so maybe um, this page explains more clearly. So after uh, rearranging the indices, we'll have it as follows. So we have the first r equations from x1 to xr as a basic variable. They'll have zero on the right-hand side. And then we'll have equation with the index r plus 1 to m, these ones with the right-hand side that's strictly positive. And then we still have the um, objective function. And we call this problem 2. Okay, and then um, we refer to um, the constraints with 0 on the right-hand side to be the equation number from star to double star and the objective function, we label it as O. Okay, the next step, step three. Now consider the system from equation star to double star, where the right-hand sides are zero. So if we look at 
this system here as just a set of constraints, we see that it's in canonical form with the basic variables x1 to xr. Mm -hmm. And we also observe that the other variables, basic variables for the rest of the equation, xr plus 1 to xm, they never appear in this system. Okay, that means we can con construct a linear programming problem using um, these R equation as constraint and the O as objective function. And then the LP problem, this constraint plus O, this can be solved by pivoting step because this is the one with total number of constraint R and R is less than M, and that's by the induction assumption, everything is fine for R less than M. Okay, and now we'll consider the whole problem too. We can apply the same pivot step in, in the, this part three here that solved this problem on this whole system here then the resulting system will still be canonical and uh, the z0 value is unchanged because right hand side is zero you always add zero onto it okay now we um, are facing two possible cases which we will discuss in some detail so the first case when you do all the pivoting step and after that you found that all the cijs are bigger than zero. Then you can apply the optimality criterion theorem to say that the minimum is reached, and then you stop. And the second case is the case where um, you have um, ck for some k is negative, and then the coefficient a for the first R equation here, all these A's are less than zero. So this is the um, this is the case that if you only consider the first R equation as the constraint, you would have an unbounded um, minimum. Okay, but now we include the rest um, M minus R equations, and then we have more A's to look at. There are still now two more subcases. Okay, part A. So, under this case, now we look at the A i case for the i bigger than r, and we found that they are all less than or equal to zero. Then this means now we can apply theorem U, and then we can conclude that the minimum is unbounded. And part B is still under this assumption, and then we look at the A i case for i bigger than r, and we found that some of them are positive. So if that is the case, then we can perform a pivoting step following our theorem m, the one for the actual simplex method. Okay, And then since now the bi's on the right hand side for i bigger than r is strictly positive, um, by the theorem m we know that we actually will strictly reduce this minus z0 value after the pivot step. What does it mean is that you will actually reduce the value of the objective function at the basic feasible solution. Okay, now let's put them together. And um, all these steps we have talked step one, two, three, four. Through all these steps, now we have a sequence of pivot that either completes the problem or would strictly decrease the value minus z0. So we could repeat this loop multiple rounds and infinitely many uh, steps uh, rounds, the simplex method will be completed. Okay, so um, now we can conclude that for case A, 
where not all the bi's are zero, then there exists a sequence of pivoting, possibly complicated, but there exists, such that the simplex method for the problem will be completed. And now, um, the big part, capital B. So we consider the counterpart. So finally, we consider the case where all the bi's are zero for the original LP problem. Then um, we can simply invoke lemma B, which says that the same sequence in step capital A, which we have discussed here, and would complete the procedure as well. Okay, so um, then this completes the whole proof of theorem C. Okay, before we stop, let's make um, some final remarks. We want to say two things. One thing is kind of a, a, a annoying thing. So the proof we have gone through, it shows that there exists a pivot sequence that will complete the simplest method. But it doesn't tell us exactly how to construct one. This still leaves it open, the possibility of cycling, and uh, it did not discuss the detail of how to deal with cycling. Okay. Second remark, that's a good thing, is that the proof would also give us the existence of solution for the LP problem. So the LP problem will have a solution which is either unbounded or bounded. It exists. Okay, so um, let's state a corollary, which is a um, direct or immediate consequence of theorem C. It states as follows. If you have an LP problem which has feasible solutions and the objective function is bounded, then there exists at least one feasible basic solution at which z attains its minimum. Okay, so it okay, so that's all for this video, and uh, in the next video we will start to discuss about more abstract um, concepts, a concept of convexity, which is probably the most important concept in the linear programming. Okay, so hope you enjoy this. I'll see you next time.